Alex Reese Jones. I'm a new assistant professor in the Open Department at Wharton. And uh, I work primarily on field and policy applications of behavioral economics. So in this particular project, I'm going to be studying a particular case of suboptimal behavior uh, in a setting that actually has a lot of policy relevance. So the particular setting uh, is uh, the medical match, uh, the medical residency match. So we'll be, we'll be looking at decisions medical students make as they're going through the process of graduating from medical school and getting paired off to residency programs. And the basic takeaway is that some of these students will be uh, following strategies of reporting their preferences that appear to be suboptimal. We'll think about the implications and consequences of that kind of behavior. So let's start getting into the details of uh, the medical match. So I know for many people in this room, this is uh, an unnecessary description. But for those of you who aren't physicians, uh, if you're trying to become a doctor in the United States, you basically go through this quick process. Uh, well, quick on the slide, not quick in life. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so, so first you go to medical school. Uh, first you go to medical school. That takes about uh, four years. At the end of medical school, you have an MD, and you have the basic core of training that all doctors share. Uh, at this point, though, you don't jump immediately into being a practicing physician. You typically go through a period called a residency where you get hands-on training specific to your specialty. Uh, some, some professions or some subspecialties require an additional fellowship for more training after that. And then finally, you get to practice medicine and experience all of the pros and cons that that lifestyle uh, entails. So again, we're going to be focusing specifically on this jump between medical school and the residency. So to go to, uh, to, go to a residency, uh, you know, here's basically what happens. In your last year in medical school, uh, in the fall, you generally apply to a reasonably large number of, of residencies. These residencies uh, will go through an initial round of screening, decide who they're interested in, and invite them to come visit and interview and see the place, learn a little bit about the possible match. After this has gone on, everyone submits their preferences to a central and neutral uh, matching agency, the National Resident Matching Program. So students would send in a list saying, my first choice residency is X, my second choice is Y, and so on. Residencies do the same thing for students, and uh, the final match is, is allocated, and that's basically binding. Uh, and the basic question I want to ask is, how are people thinking about the incentives as they go through this process, uh, and you know, how, how are these decisions made? So to get at that, I ran a large survey in the lead up to the uh, 2012 residency match. So uh, in, the, in the months between September and January leading up to that match, I contact virtually every medical school in the United States, about 120 of them. Uh, as a result of those efforts, I got 23 schools to agree to let me survey their students uh, as they were going through this process. And the basic experience is immediately after the deadline for submitting uh, the residency match uh, rank order information, uh, students receive an email from some representative at their school, typically an associate dean or something like that. And it would have a link to a web survey. And the survey had a few modules, one of which was focused on the, uh, their self-assessment of their truthful behavior in this setting. So that's what we'll be focusing on today. So the, the most relevant question, in some sense, uh, to this, uh, this overall exercise is the following. So we asked, when forming the ranking of residencies to submit to the National Residency Matching Program, some candidates submit an ordering that is not the true order of how desirable they find the programs. Uh, when forming your list, did you report the exact ordering of your true preferences? And they could say yes no with a couple multiple choice options, and then they had a free response uh, opportunity to basically describe what they're doing. Uh, so overall, you know, looking across everyone in the sample, about 83% of people uh, got it right according to the theory. They, they said they told the truth, and they perceived that they told the truth. Um, across the, the remainder, about 5% explicitly said, uh, no, I didn't tell the truth. I chose my list strategically. And this, this option was kind of a trap, because behaving strategically correctly here is telling the truth. Um, but in the free responses, these type of uh, respondents generally describe some sort of strategic considerations or heuristics that would often make sense in other matching problems we face in life, like college choice, things like that. But in this setting, they don't make sense, and they are actually suboptimal. You see that not 100% of people are getting this right, but you should be wondering, uh, you know, why should you care? Is this a problem for the market as a whole if it's only, say, 5%? And the answer to that question really depends on how well correlated this behavior is with uh, ability. Right, so imagine the case where, uh, you know, to be uh, kind of flippant about it, you know, only the dumb doctors get this wrong. Uh, so in that case, this is actually not a big problem for, for welfare, right? If, if the lowest ability people make this mistake and are punished, it's actually helping you sort through people and, and optimally match people to the residencies of their ability. Now, alternatively, you could imagine it's totally unassociated with ability, in which case there's actually a possibility for huge welfare effects. Uh, people who belong at the top 
could get moved, and that creates cascade effects, which moves around the allocation of the entire market. Uh, in, the, in the paper, I have some simulation studies demonstrating how quickly this can uh, kind of spiral out of control, uh, but I'm kind of skipping over it for the purposes of time here. Uh, the main result I'm demonstrating in this slide is that if we predict people who are, have self-assessed strategic behavior, or strategic here means non-truthful strategic behavior, uh, this is quite precisely estimated to be effectively unassociated with any reasonable measures of ability that we have, such as college GPA, MCAT scores, uh, medical licensing exam scores, et cetera. The only thing that predicts truthful behavior at all, and even then somewhat weakly, uh, is, is whether you're male or female. Uh, so uh, women in this sample are a bit more uh, truthful than men. You know, just as some students don't understand the need for strategy, you know, when you put them in complicated strategic environments, it's also the case that some students don't understand the strategic incentives they face when they're very easy, when they're telling you just to tell the truth. And this is true even in this setting, which in some sense is the field setting where you would most expect people to get this kind of thing right. right? So we often see failures to maximize uh, you know, in lab studies, for example. And the common argument of the audience, uh, you know, the hostile portion of the audience is, oh, well, if this were more incentivized, they'd get it right. If these people were smarter, they'd get it right. If you provided them more training, they'd get it right. And really, this is a setting where we've done all of that to the kind of maximum degree we can. Uh, this population is smarter than the, than the general population by a good margin, uh, or at least that's what they will tell you. Um, this is an extremely well-informed and deliberated and high-stakes decision. Right? They have months to think about this. They've visited all these places. They know their options very well. And there's significant training and advice provided on how to behave in this, in this environment. They're being told to tell the truth uh, by a number of people. Although, of course, you're told to tell the truth regularly in life, and normally that's not a strategic statement. That's a moral statement. So there's some possibility that they just don't make that distinction. The welfare implications, uh, based on the results I just showed you, are possibly severe. Uh, this can really uh, affect uh, everyone in the market, not just the people making the mistake. And that's an important distinction to, to make. If you enter this market and tell the truth, if you behave optimally, it's possible that even a small fraction of people getting this wrong will affect you. Depending on uh, a variety of factors, it could affect you positively or negatively. But importantly, it is possible that you will be harmed by uh, the, the lack of sophistication of people elsewhere in the market. The one line takeaway I, I have of this paper as a whole is that Eliminating the role of strategy does not necessarily eliminate the role for behavioral considerations. We still need to think more about what would happen in these types of matching markets uh, when some people just don't quite get it and how to build mechanisms that are robust to, uh, to people with severe cognitive constraints. Mm -hmm.